Hello, welcome to lecture 12 of our Essentials of Semiconductor Device Physics course. In this lecture, we're going to derive the very important Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay, so last time we defined a, a strategy to label states of the total system. Re recall that the system we are interested in is the ideal electron gas and we're labeling each state by placing the letter O on top of the orbitals that are occupied and the letter U on top of the orbitals that are unoccupied. And as an example, these are the six states of the total system satisfying the condition energy equal to two times the energy of the uh, orbital 112 and two electrons. So the multiplicity is for this energy and number of particles is six. So in this lecture, we want to answer the question, what is the probability of finding a specific orbital of an electron gas occupied? So this term gas denotes a macroscopic system. We have a macroscopic number of electrons in the system. But to show how we're going to calculate it, we're going to start by considering a microscopic system, a small system, like the system with two electrons only. Once we show the logic in a microscopic system, then we extend it to the macroscopic system, in other words, to the gas of electrons. So that's the strategy we're going to use in this lecture. So let's pick an orbital as an example to make the explanation more concrete. So let's say that our goal is to find the probability of the orbital 211 to be occupied. So we're going to highlight the orbital of interest in the blue color. And notice that I picked this orbital just because I had to choose one as an example, but it could be any other orbital of the, of the list. Now, if, we are, if we want to know what is the probability of finding the orbital 211 occupied, we need to identify which states of the total system have the orbital 211 occupied. And these two states have the orbital 211 occupied. In all other states, the orbital 211 is unoccupied. So in this example, our answer is very simple. Recall that with the fundamental assumption of statistical physics, we assume that all states are equally probable. In this example, we have six states. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two of these states have the orbital of interest occupied. So the probability of finding the system in a state where the orbital 211 is occupied is two out of six. Just because we have two, two states that satisfy the condition that we are looking for. In other words, the orbital 211 occupied. So in this case, it was very easy to find the answer because we could just count the states that have the orbital of interest occupied. And we, ha we don't have many states. It's possible to count because the system is small. It's a microscopic system. It has only two particles. It's a small system. But we need to develop a way of extending this idea of doing this calculation when you have lots of states. And to do that, we're going to reorganize the list a little bit. So we're going to start by placing all states with our orbital of interest occupied on the top. So we're going to get this state here and move to this position just because we want these two states with the orbit of interest occupied on the top of the list. So that's all we've done. We just move the positions of the uh, list so as to have 
all states with the orbital of interest occupied on the top. Now we make a second uh, modification of the way we are labeling uh, the list. So we're going to take the orbital of interest and move it to the first column. So this is, this is again only a rearrangement of the way we are labeling. This is, there is no physics in this. We are just moving the orbital of interest to the first uh, position so, so as to make the visualization easier. So that's what we've done. It's still the same list. I just swapped the position of the orbital 111 with the orbital of interest. So here we still have the same list as before, organized in a way that the orbital of interest is in the first uh, slot and all states with the orbital of interest occupied are on the top. And now we're going to make a conceptual, not physical, only conceptual uh, division. We're going to call the orbit of interest a system A and all the other orbitals we're going to call system B. So we're not doing any physical modification. We're just uh, determining a new language. We're going to call by definition system B the system composed by all orbitals except the orbital of interest. So with this uh, conceptual division, we can express the number of states of the total system having the orbital of interest occupied in terms of the multiplicity of system B. So to understand that, consider that if we have the orbital of interest occupied, that means that the energy of system A is the energy of the orbital of interest and the number of particles of system A is one. We have one electron in system A. So that means that the energy of system B must be the total energy, this total energy minus the energy of the orbital of interest and also that system B must have one electron, so the total number of electrons minus one. In other words, we have two states of the total system where the orbital of interest is occupied because there are two states of system B having the complementary energy and the complementary number of particles. In other words, the multiplicity of system B evaluated that the complementary energy and complementary number of particles is 2. In the same way, we have four states of the total system having the orbital of interest unoccupied because now in this case the energy of system A is 0 because there is no electron and the number of particles in system A is also 0. So we must have system B with the total energy, so the energy of system B must coincide with the total energy and system B must also have the total number of particles, in this example too. In other words, the multiplicity of system B evaluated at the total energy and total number of particles is 4. That's why we have 4 states of the total system having the orbital of interest unoccupied. So if we want to know the probability of having the orbital 211 occupied, all we need to do is to take the number of states having this, pro this orbital occupied and divide by the total number of states, which is the sum of the number of states where it is occupied with the number of states that it's unoccupied. In this case, this number coincides with the multiplicity of system B evaluated at the complementary energy and complementary number of particles. And we have just seen that is true. And here, notice that this is not the multiplicity of system B. This is the multiplicity 
of the total system. And we have six states at the total system uh, with the total energy and total number of particles. So be careful, we have only in the numerator the multiplicity of system B. Here I am already using the total multiplicity. But of course, this coincides with this multiplicity plus this multiplicity. 2 plus 4 is 6. And likewise, we could ask what is the probability of finding orbital 2, 1, 1, 1 unoccupied. So this probability is the number of states where it is unoccupied. So here, now in the numerator, we are using the multiplicity evaluated at the total energy and total number of particles. So now we have 4 uh, divided by 6. And notice that again here is the multiplicity of the total system. And of course, if we add the probability of finding the orbital 211 occupied with the probability of finding it unoccupied, we must get 1 because the orbital will be either occupied or unoccupied. Okay, so now we're going to move to our main job. Now we're going to consider a macroscopic system, so a gas of electrons. Now the total energy and the total number of particles correspond to the total energy and number of particles of a, of a macroscopic system. So n naught would be of the order of 10 to the power of 23, for example. So we cannot uh, make the list in practice, but we could make it in principle. In principle, we could have the same list as we had before, uh, placing all states where the orbital of interest is occupied on the top and all states where the orbital of interest uh, is unoccupied in the bottom. And we could make the same conceptual division called the orbital of interest system A and the order uh, orbitals system B. But now, instead of calling it system B, we're going to call it system R for reservoir because all the other orbitals constitute a macroscopic system that is much, much larger than our system A. So it satisfies the criterion we have for a reservoir. And we can follow ex exactly the same logic that we followed when we were considering the system with two electrons only. In, so the probability of finding our orbital of interest occupied is just the number of states where the orbital of interest is occupied divided by the total number of states. Now, this term we express in terms of the multiplicity of the reservoir evaluated at the complementary energy and complementary number of particles, number of electrons. So if this orbital is occupied, the energy of the reservoir must be the total energy minus the energy of the orbital. And since the orbital is occupied, system A has one electron, so system B must have n not electrons minus one. And G, again, here, is the multiplicity of the total system. And if we, uh, if we ask what is the probability of finding the orbital unoccupied, we follow the same logic, but now we need the number of states where the orbital is unoccupied, and that will be the multiplicity of the reservoir evaluated at the energy, at the total energy and total number of particles. Now, to get rid of this multiplicity, we take the ratio of the probability we, we want to the uh, probability of the orbital uh, to be unoccupied. So this ratio reduces to this term. So it's just this term divided by this term. And we can again uh, express the multiplicity in terms of the entropy using our definition of entropy in, in terms of the multiplicity. And now we can use the same logic we used in lecture 10. 
we can take the entropy of the reservoir, expand it in a Taylor series, and retain only the first order terms. And in this case, the epsilon is the energy of the orbit of interest, and the number of particles is 1. And then if we do that, we can uh, replace uh, this term with the definition of temperature. And we can replace this term with the definition of uh, potential. Okay, so using the Taylor expansion in this term, we end up with this term. And then we can move this term from the denominator to the numerator. So this it picks a negative sign here. So this term uh, cancels this. And we are left with only this exponential, which you can rearrange like that. OK, so using the Taylor expansion, we obtain this expression for the ratio of probabilities. Now, to get the absolute probability is very easy because we know that the sum of the probability of finding the orbital occupied with the probability of finding it unoccupied must be 1. So, to get the absolute probability, we can express the sum in this form, placing the probability we want in, in evidence. And now we can use uh, this equation here. Notice that here we have the ratio of the probability of it being occupied to the probability of being unoccupied. And here's the other way around. So this negative sign here becomes positive because it's the, this is the inverse of this. And once we do that, then we can just move this term to the, to the other side and we finally obtain the absolute probability of finding the orbital of interest occupied. So notice here that this probability depends only on the energy of the orbital, on the total potential of the system, and on the temperature of the system. And of course, this is a general result because we could have chosen any orbital to do the calculation. So if we had chosen an orbital C, we would have the same expression but now using the energy of the orbital C. So this is the general uh, expression. And this expression is the Fermi-Dirac dist distribution. So the Fermi-Dirac distribution is the probability of finding a specific orbital C occupied. That's exactly what we derived. And we use the Taylor expansion. So we can only do that if the other system is macroscopic. In other words, the Fermi-Dirac distribution is only valid when we are um, talking about a large number of electrons. In other words, when we are dealing with an electron gas. And finally, recall that the Fermi-Dirac distribution depends only on the energy of the orbit of interest, the total potential, and the temperature of the uh, of the system. Now we learned in lecture nine that the total potential is the electrochemical potential. In other words, it is the Fermi level. So this parameter here is the Fermi level. Now notice that the way we derived the Fermi Dirac distribution, we were essentially treating the orbital of interest as a system as a system A, all the or and all the orbitals as the reservoir. And our system A was in thermal and diffusive contact with the reservoir because it could change particles. In other words, the, an electron can uh, move from an orb the orbital of interest to any other orbital. And it also has a thermal contact because the, it can exchange energy. So. That means that we, it should be possible to derive the fermi dirac distribution using the Gibbs sum. Recall from lecture 10 that the Gibbs sum gives the probability of finding uh, the system of interest, in this case system A, in a specific state 
when it is in thermal and diffusive contact with a reservoir, which is exactly the case we have you treating our orbit of interest as system A. So this is the expression for this probability that we derived in lecture 10. Beta here is a given state of the system of interest, system A, and G is the Gibbs sum. So in our case, we have two possible states for system A. System, the orbit of interest may be occupied or unoccupied. These are the only possible states. If it is occupied, then the energy is the energy of the orbital. And the number of particles is one, because we have one electron in system A. If it is unoccupied, then there is no energy and no electron. That means that the Gibbs sum is reduced to only two terms. So this sum, called this, the Gibbs sum, runs over all states of system A. In this case, we have only two states, occupied and unoccupied. So we have only these two exponentials. This one is for the state occupied. This one is for the state unoccupied. So this term here becomes 1 because we have the exponential to 0. And this term here becomes this term. I just uh, remove the number 1 here because this is the number of particles, which in this case is 1. So we want the probability of finding it in the state occupied. So this exponential here, beta, is the state occupied. So the energy is uc and the number of particles is 1. So that's the term we need in the numerator. So if just a bit of mathematical manipulation, we can just multiply uh, the numerator and the denominator by the exponential with a positive sign. So here, this multiplication, get, we get 1 here, we get 1 here, and this one here becomes this term. So when we multiply the numerator and denominator by the exponential, we end up with the Fermi Dirac distribution. So that makes sense because it's the same logic. We derive this expression for the Gibbs sum using exactly the same logic we use to derive the Fermi Dirac distribution. So it must also be applied. In other words, the Fermi Dirac distribution can be understood as a particular application of these expressions we derived from lecture 10. But in the literature, the most common form you're going to find for the Fermi Dirac distribution is not this one, but this one. So I don't like this form because this is explicitly a function of the energy of the orbital. So it is easy to forget that this probability is a probability of finding a specific orbital with energy epsilon occupied, as opposed to finding the electron with the energy epsilon. That's the uh, most natural interpretation, but it, it is wrong. The correct interpretation is that, as we have seen, this is the probability of finding a specific orbital C occupied, but the function itself depends only on the energy of the orbital C. So calling this energy epsilon, we have mathematically a function of the energy of the orbital. So this is why this is usually, usually expressed as a function of the energy of the orbital. But don't forget that this is, uh, this, this is the probability of finding a specific orbital occupied. If more than one orbital has the same energy epsilon, then we are obtaining the probability of each one of these orbitals to be occupied independently. And the Fermi Dirac distribution gives us a nice uh, and intuitive interpretation of the meaning of thermal energy. So to see that, we can uh, plot the Fermi Dirac distribution against the normalized energy. So the energy here is normalized to the Fermi level. So this is the point one 
where the energy uh, has the same value of the Fermi level. And here in this axis, we have the, the, the probability. So notice that since this is a probability, it has to range from 0 to 1. Now, in the blue line, we have uh, the plot of this probability when the temperature goes to 0 uh, kelvins. And you can see that there is a discontinuity around the energy uh, with having the same value of the Fermi level. And bef before the, the discontinuity, we have that the probability is 1, and after it, we have that the probability is 0. So before we talk about the physical meaning of this discontinuity, let's uh, make sure that we understand where it comes from. It's, it's not difficult. Okay, so let's begin with this region here. So in this region, we have the numbers uh, lower than 1, which means that the energy is lower than the Fermi level. So if the energy is lower than the Fermi level, this term here in the numerator is a negative number. As t goes to 0, we get uh, this term approaching the exponential of minus, minus because this is going to be minus, infinite, and infinite because t is going to 0 at the condition we are examining. So we have that the fermi dirac distribution will, will be reduced to 1 divided by 1 plus 0 because the exponential of minus infinity is 0. So that is 1. That's why we get 1 here. Now when we cross the threshold here, now the energy is larger than the Fermi level. So this term here is a positive number and we get the exponential of plus infinity, which is an infinite number. And that's why we have now here 1 divided by infinite, which is of course 0. Now what does that mean physically? Since the Fermi Dirac distribution is the, gives the probability of finding an orbital occupied by an electron, and the, the Fermi Dirac distribution is 1 for uh, orbitals with energy lower than the Fermi level, it means that we have 100% of chance of finding these orbitals occupied by an electron, which means that all orbitals with energy lower than the Fermi level are occupied. And in the same uh, way, all orbitals with energy above the Fermi level, with energy higher than the Fermi level, will be unoccupied. So that's the interpretation for the temperature approaching zero. And that actually is the official definition of Fermi level. The official definition makes reference to the, to the temperature approaching zero kelvins, but nobody in the semiconductor community is using this definition anymore. The, the new definition is that the Fermi level is the chemical pot electrochemical potential for any temperature, so we're going to stick to this new usage. Now, when we increase the temperature, for example, to room temperature, which gives us this green line, we can see that the discontinuity is softened. So what happens? What, how, what's the difference between the green and the blue line physically? Obviously, now, uh, some orbitals with energy lower than the Fermi level become unoccupied, and some orbitals with energy uh, higher than the Fermi level becomes occupied. In other words, when the temperature uh, increased from 0 to 300 kelvins, some uh, electrons that were in this, the orbitals with lower energy were excited to orbitals with higher energy. And the Fermi Dirac distribution is teaching how, what are the, these probabilities of occupation. So it's giving a physical interpretation of thermal energy. Thermal energy is uh, the energy that was pumped into the system, captured by the higher temperature, and that allowed some electrons to be excited from uh, orbitals with lower energy to orbitals with higher energy. And as we increase the temperature even further, the 
probability of finding these orbitals uh, with lower energy occupied reduces even further and the probabilities of finding orbitals with higher energy occupied increases. That means that more electrons were excited from these orbitals to these orbitals, again, due to thermal energy, due to the fact that the orbital is interacting with an external environment at temperature uh, 600 kelvins in this example. Finally, notice that when the energy has the same value of the Fermi level, then we get 1 divided by, by 1 plus the exponential of the Fermi level minus the Fermi level, that's 0, so the exponential uh, takes the number 1, so we have that the probability is 1 over 2. So that gives yet another interpretation for the Fermi level. The Fermi level is the energy at which and the probability of occupation of an orbital is 50%. So with that, we conclude our uh, lecture on the Fermi Dirac distribution. We're going to use it uh, to calculate the concentration of electrons and holes in semiconductors, but that's going to be in the second part of this, of this course, when we start talking about the physics of semiconductors per se. We still have to cover uh, three topics in this uh, first part. And in the next lecture, we're going to cover drift current, then we're going to see diffusion current, and then the continuity equation. And then we are done in this first part and move to the physics of semiconductor uh, per se. So I see you in the next lecture.